Okay, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 6, and uh, the title is just a little bit misleading this morning because God actually changed the direction late in the week uh, of what I was going to... Uh, emphasis I was going to bring this morning. As a matter of fact, I'll get your hopes up here because I'm only going to preach on one verse. Okay. Oh boy, we'll get out of here early for lunch. Oh, uh, no, we're going over to Romans chapter 14 before we get done. <laughs> okay, in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. Now, uh, before I read it, let's, let's remember where we're coming from here. Uh, God had the day of Pentecost. Church was born. And the church started growing. Okay? And adding to, multiplying, actually, not just adding, but multiplying. And they were growing, growing, growing. So, you know, the Lord, or the Satan said, well, they can't have this. So he raised up enemies to the church and they started having uh, the apostles uh, imprisoned and beaten, you know. But that didn't slow them down. Because whenever they got beaten, they just went back to the church and said, hey, glory, hallelujah, I got beat for Jesus, you know. It was a happy thing, you know. We're making a difference here. As a matter of fact, in the early century there, you've heard about the martyrs of the early century, first century, second century church, and how that they would take them and, um, into the arena, the Roman uh, uh, governors and so on would, and they would tear them asunder, they would impale them, they would, uh, Nero, uh, Nero, I believe it was, actually lit them on fire, put tar on them and lit Christians on fire to illuminate the arena okay did you know that in that day people thought that was such an honor to die for God they would actually request to be martyred I mean it wasn't them to come dragging them out and I know you've heard about maybe uh, the book of martyrs that I think it's on the back windowsill here somewhere it talks about the martyrs how they would go to their death singing hymns and, you know, we kind of, in my mind anyway, I don't know if you did, but you think about the Titanic where they were singing hymns at the end because it's, you know, I'm going to see Jesus. Don't really want to, but I'm going. That wasn't the way they were in the first century. In the first century, they were singing hymns of praise because I get to give my all to Jesus. He died for me. I get to die for him. That's sort of hard to understand for us. But that's the way they were. It's kind of the mindset they had back there. So the apostles would come back and uh, disciples and they'd say, hey man, it was a great day. We got to suffer for Jesus today. Let's get out here and win some more souls. And they'd preach and they'd preach the word of God. They'd preach Jesus himself and people were added to the church. And we came down here just last uh, week there where we were talking about Ananias and, well, that was week four last, I think. Ananias and Sapphira. Satan said, well, we can't discourage them by beating them and putting them in jail we, we'll just have to uh, approach their human side so they lied to the Holy Spirit about how much money they'd sold the piece of property for and uh, Jesus through Peter said not not can't have this it, it won't go so he actually took their life right in front of the congregation husband first wife later and a great fear fell upon the church and uh, there were many more added to them but the unbelievers a lot of them said no I ain't getting around that group because this God they worship kills them takes their life right there in front of everybody else and that didn't work and then last week I took a verse that I sort of breezed over a week before and talked about the shadow that we cast. As a matter of fact, I still have the picture up here because this morning thinks a little bit about that shadow. Uh, talked about such great miracles and happenings in the early church there that people would actually get the sick and, and the, the lame and they would bring them out in the street and they'd lay them on the sidewalk because everybody couldn't get Peter and John to be healed, you know, to have a healing service. So their reckoning was, and evidently it worked, that we'll lay them here and if Peter and John's shadow fall across them, it'll heal them, you know. And I brought from that that you and I still cast a long shadow. 
you know as we live for Jesus Christ as we walk our our walk and talk our talk our characters our personalities the way we interact with people it touches lives and that's the first ministry or first witness we have in the world amen amen well today as we get into chapter 6 Satan's still trying he's trying to cause trouble but I'm not going to emphasize him I'm going to emphasize what he was using okay Verse 1, and in those days when the number of disciples was what? Multiplied. Multiplied. People were being added to the church here, okay? There arose a what? <laughs> What's a murmuring? A complaint. A dissatisfaction. Uh, you know, that I, you know, it's not going right here, you know. And we get those with each other, don't we? Because everybody don't think, if everybody would think the way I do and do what I think they ought to, I wouldn't have any cause to murmur about anybody. Would you? If it all, if everybody do what you want them to? Hmm? But I'm not going to say wouldn't that be great because it probably wouldn't be great. Because sometimes I, I want to a thing or a, a situation to go a certain way and I find out later on it wouldn't have been good if it went that way, you know. There was a murmuring that rose up of the Grecians. Now, Grecians here is what were called in uh, the first century church Hellenistic Jews, okay? And the Hebrews, which is the Hebraic Jews, okay? Now, who were these guys? We don't get a lot of explanation about it. Uh, all through Jewish history in the Old Testament there, and, and they had been in the land after uh, Joshua went over and they conquered it. They sinned against God and then they were dispersed with the Babylonian captivity and during that age and so on. They were dispersed throughout the world. Okay? It's going to happen again soon here in the book of Acts that because of the persecution of the church all are going to leave except the apostles out of Jerusalem, okay? And they're going to be dispersed. It's called diaspersia. Diaspersia. And because of that, people had went to other countries, mainly up in uh, Greece, Greece, that area up through there. And that's where a lot of Paul's missionary journeys were, you know, up through Greece and around up through there. And they had picked up Grecian ways. Now, if you want to compare it to the day, and even not comparing to the day, many theologians will tell you that the Hellenistic Jews were more liberal than the Hebraic Jews. So you had a liberal and a conservative group, okay? And yet they were all Jewish Christians because we're talking about the Christian church here, okay? Now, you remember we discussed it in, in uh, sermons past that what was happening here, uh, what got Ananias and Sapphira in, into problem and trouble was the fact that the mindset of a good Christian person was what I own does not really belong to me. It belongs to God. So if I see another brother or sister that has a need, as Barnabas did, I'll sell a portion of land that I own and give it to the apostles so that they can help the people that need it. No, they didn't consider things to actually be theirs. They all belong to God and we distribute it as we had need. Okay? And so that was the mindset as they come in here. So they were doing that. So what murmuring rose between the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews because their widows were neglected in the daily administration. And there's scriptures that we can go back and read and talk about that we are to, you know, if you, do, if you don't have family to take care of widows and orphans, then the church is supposed to take care of we, widows and orphans. And that's what they were doing here, doing a good thing, but we had two different groups of two different mindsets, okay? And a little of each of them were in uh, ruling power in the church there. 
because we're going to talk later on, and that's where I thought I was going with this about the deacons, okay? And you had uh, Stephen was called out as a deacon, Philip was called out as a deacon, and others. Stephen was of Jewish ancestry. Uh, excuse me, Greek ancestry. His mom was a Jewess and his father was a Greek, okay? And whenever he was born, he was probably born in Greek. In, in, where is it? Greece. Get the right word out here. And so he would have been considered a Hellenistic Jew, okay? Philip, however, would have been a uh, Hebraic Jew. So we had two different mindsets that were working together, trying to do God's will and trying to govern the church. Are, are you following what I'm laying out here? In other words, we, we got a board. Let's call it a board, okay? They, they were apostles and disciples, but we'll call it the church board. And we had some that were liberal and some that were conservative, some Hellenistic, some Hebraic. And they came from different backgrounds and they had different uh, happenings in their life. They were raised in different cultures and they'd picked up different ways. Now here comes Peter, who was leading the church at that time overall. And uh, God gave him dreams. And he gave him a dream of a big sheet coming down from heaven. And within that sheet were all kinds of uh, beasts and animals that God said, kill, eat. And yet they were animals that the Old Testament law said, we don't do that. They're unclean. You know, they're, uh, shrimp. You like shrimp? You couldn't eat shrimp if you was a good Jew in the Old Testament, okay? Because they, they were unclean. Certain animals, if they didn't chew their cud right or have the flip, split hoof just right the way it's supposed to be, you didn't eat those, you know. Uh, pork, you, you couldn't have pulled pork, you know. But God showed Peter this dream and three times he let it down, took it up in heaven and said, kill, eat. Now, right after he woke up from his nap, which actually God gave him that vision while he was napping, when he woke up, there was a knock on the door downstairs. He was staying with a, someone in Joppa there. And lo and behold, it was messengers from, I think he was Greek too, a, a soldier, leader of soldiers over the way and said, come, I've got sickness in my household. I want you to heal it, you know. Well, a good Jew didn't go into a, a non-Jewish house and eat or whatever else. And Peter was a good Jewish leader, okay? But what God had done, he showed him with that sheet and these animals. And in that terminology there, he said, do not call unclean what I say is clean. So he was changing his methodology of how we as followers of God are to behave and to act. Even Jewish people, okay? Whenever we come to the Lord. So it's a whole lot like the way he changed the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, he didn't change his mind. Don't ever say that God changed his mind because God is immutable. He does not change. He's the same past, present, future. Yeah, always be the same. Okay? But in his plan, he had planned that the Holy Spirit, after Jesus died, rose again, and ascended back to glory, he would change the way that he reacts to people rather than coming upon them, as we read about uh, David in our Sunday school lesson this morning, he would come and dwell their heart and their life. So that the day you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit of God came to indwell you, to minister in and through you, and to seal you into the day of redemption. Okay? Old Testament, they could lose the power of the Holy Spirit because he would leave them and come back upon them. Today, he indwells us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He's there. So what God was doing in this transition period, and that's what the book of Acts is here in the early church, 
He was telling Peter that we're not going to live strictly by the Old Testament dietary laws, nor are we going to live by the Old Testament laws of how people come to know Jesus or God the Father through Jesus Christ, okay? In other words, in the Old Testament, a Greek or any other uh, non-Jewish person could actually come to God through the Jewish religion, but they had to become a Jew. They had to be circumcised and they had to go through all the ritual and everything. They had to obey the law. So God, through this vision that he gave to Peter here, was telling him that I'm changing the way, uh, you know, in my plan, the way that I work with people and they come to me. And all through Paul's ministry, if you go back through all the letters, the epistles that are in the Bible here, where Paul and John and others are trying to teach people what it means to be a Christian, okay, that's what they're doing. And they're giving them these transitions. Now, it was hard because the Jews were very, uh, I won't say magnetic, but I think that's the wrong word, very determined that our way is the right way. Okay? But here we've got the Hebraic Jews that think that way, and then we've got the Hellenistic Jews that don't. Well, they were discriminating against the two groups, okay? And that's what this particular scripture is talking about here. But why was the discrimination there? Why did the Hellenistic Jews feel the discrimination that was there? It was from the attitude of the Christians of the first century. It was from the way that they were feeling and thinking. Uh, turn in your Bibles back to Romans before I run out of time here. Go to Romans chapter 14 because Paul uh, helps us in his letter to the Romans understand better about what we're talking about here. I'm just going to read one verse to start with and then I'm going to skip over to uh, uh, verse 1 and then to 19 and then I'm going into 15 because I don't have time to go through both these chapters here this morning. Go home, read them, uh, look at your notes you're taking this morning about what I'm saying here and what I derived out of this and feel that God gave me to give you and uh, understand it. Now first off, Paul says in chapter 14, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Okay, he's going to talk about the weaker brother. People that come to know the Lord Jesus Christ more pointedly, Jewish people that come to know Jesus, and they've been steeped in the Old Testament law. You don't eat these things. You do eat these things. Uh, you know, you separate yourself from the uh, secular world, and you're, you're not a part of the uh, non-Jewish world, and you separate here. That's instilled in them, and it's in their minds there. And then over into uh, verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, things wherewith one may edify one another. In other words, what we need to do in bringing it down to you and I in our day to day, we live in uh, a world that people, number one, have different personality traits. We talked about that a little bit downstairs. We've got different ways that we were raised and things that we were raised on believing were the proper way to do things and the not proper way. Some people not even taught what was proper and not proper one way or another. And we're definitely in the day and age where everybody does everything and does what they seem right in their own mind, you know. But we need to pull together as a Christian group, as did the early century church. They settled that. Now, we'll go in that probably next week. What did they do? Paul said that it's getting too busy around, or Peter did, said it's getting too busy around here. I, I, I shouldn't leave study and prayer and preparation for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ and the knowledge of how to live for him. I shouldn't leave that to, to take care of the widows and the orphans. 
Gentiles. You know, so call out seven men who we called, or they called what? Deacons uh, to serve to do this, so I can be freed up. Peter says to do what I'm supposed to do. So they started up uh, that uh, way, and they solved the problem they have. But the problem's what we want to look at: two different ideals, two different uh, way of lives, two different attitudes and personality groups that come together. And how do we get along? If you read chapter 14, which I'm not taking time to read this morning, they delve into it a little bit, okay? We, we need to learn how to mesh, how to get along with each other, how, how to disagree how? Agreeably. Agreeably, you know. And not always push for everybody to be like me, you know, or to be like I think it ought to be. Now definitely we understand what the teachings of God's Word are, and we hold people to God's uh, characters, characteristics. We are to grow like Him, but not like the way we are, you know. Well, my mom brought me up this way, and somebody else's mom brought them up that way, you know. And who was right, you know? It's about like the young married woman that every time she got a ham hock, uh, she'd take and cut off about two, three inches on the end of the ham hock, and she'd lay the ham in there and then lay the piece she cut off down below it, you know. And so the husband was sitting there, and he kept watching her and watching her, and several times this happened. And he finally asked her, Honey, I said, you know, how come you chop off that piece and lay it down beside it? And she said, well, that's the way my mama taught me. You know, I don't know exactly why she did it. So the next time they was out to the mother-in-law's house, uh, they asked, Mom, how come it is that we always cut off that little bit on the end and lay it down beside it? And the mama said, well, I don't know why you do it, but I did it because the pan wasn't long enough. <laughs> okay? There was a good reason for doing it, but they picked up the habit of doing it. And we do that. And we get it down in such a dead, pat way that we say, if you're not doing it my way, you're doing it wrong. And even if we don't say anything, sometimes we just grunt. You know, from look over at them out of the corner of your eye, you know. Roll your eyes back. You, you catch what I'm saying? And people pick up on body language, okay? And that's where we're going here. We need to be careful of that. We need to be real careful. Chapter 15 and verse 1. We then that are strong. What does that mean? We who are mature Christians, okay? We have a good basis and an understanding of what God has called us to do. And even as I shared in Sunday school this morning, I've fought for years in things that my choleric personality makes me think, well, this is the right way to do it. Let's do it that way, you know. And I fight that because everybody's not a choleric and they don't think the way that I do, you know. And so sometimes I have to say, well, I know I'm right, but we'll do it their way anyhow. <laughs> no. <laughs> Y'all got it. Okay. We that are strong in the faith ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to what? Please ourselves. Not to, you know, let's do it my way. But rather, if we see someone else that's leaning the other way, and rather than hurting their feelings, going contrary, contrary to them, we say, you know, it's not contrary to God's command and God's word. So let's just not call that point. Let's allow it to go, allow, allow it to grow. As a matter of fact, we had a controversy in the Grace Brethren Fellowship several years back about baptism, okay? Should we allow people to come into our Grace Brethren Church under single immersion baptism? Well, hey, there's more Protestants believe in single immersion than there are Protestants who believe in trial immersion. I was single immersed after I was saved. I was saved in the Church of God, a home office, Anderson, Indiana, 
and mom and dad moved not too long after that to the uh, Calvary Baptist Church which is an independent Baptist and that's where I got baptized okay well Church of God didn't baptize Triune Immersion either so it wouldn't make much difference there they did wash feet of the Church of God okay but I was baptized single immersion well, a few years after that, as God had grown me, and he led me, uh, whenever he was leading me to, to be involved in church. See, I got a period of time, Yvonne and I did there, where we didn't go to church, you know, early teenagers. We got married at 17. So along about 18, 19, we were seeking all the things, married life and fun and independence, you know, and we didn't go to church much. Well, God laid it on my heart and Yvonne's heart through John Clinton and his illness and so on. We needed to be serving him. So we got to looking around close to our house because Calvary Baptist was, uh, oh, I don't know, I think it's about 16, 17 miles away. And we said, well, let's see if we can't find a neighborhood church around here. And he led me to Patterson Memorial Grace Brethren Church. And I walked in, and Ron Thompson was a preacher there, and he preached, and I just felt comfortable. I felt that's where I would be. Yvonne, not quite so. She, she didn't have a real strong feeling on it, you know. But eventually she said, yeah, we ought to put our candlestick, you know, put our candles in the candlestick at this church. And so Ron Thompson and Ernest Bowling was an elder or a deacon at the church, and they came out to talk to us. And they said, well, if you're going to be a member of the Grace Brethren Church, they said, you can attend, you can come to our services, you know, and join in, we'll treat you like family. But if you want to have voting rights and be a member and so on and so forth, you'll have to be baptized again. And uh, so I told Ron Thompson, I said, well, I, I've been baptized. I don't see where it's going to help me any, you know. But if that's what it takes, I think this is where God wants me, then okay. Yvonne wasn't quite there. <laughs> Have I said that twice yet? <laughs> So a couple of weeks later, uh, God, you know, shared it with her or whatever, and she said, yeah, I think we ought to do this, you know, and go in here, which we were already working uh, with the teenagers in the church there, and God called us to that ministry. And so uh, we went through Triune Mercy. And at that point in time, I did it because this is where God wants me. If this is what I have to do to minister and to be a member of this church, then I don't see any harm in it. That's what we're talking about here, okay? Now, later on, I felt the call of God to, to be licensed. Not to be a preacher, but to be licensed because I was working as a youth director, a youth minister there at the church. And so I got the, uh, I was doing my studies through Liberty, but they also gave me a book about the Grace Brethren Fellowship. And it told about all the distinctives and everything, and I read up on them. And it gave me the Greek and everything. Whenever I'm teaching about baptism, I give you the Greek words and all, you know, that uh, talk about baptism and uh, how it means that we are supposed to dip repeatedly, uh, baptizo, dip repeatedly in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I came to understand this is the proper mo mode. And that's what I believe now. Uh, I think anybody that's single dips, you know, they're not going to hell. They're saved. They're being obedient. They're baptizing. But I think they got a little bit wrong, you know. Triune immersion. So I learned. You catching what I'm saying? Ron Thompson wasn't uh, any more dogmatic than he had to be at that time. Because at that time, if you brought someone into the fellowship of a Grace Brethren Church that was not triune immersed, then you could not be a part of the National Fellowship and make decisions there. Well, along the road, there was a group of people that wanted to allow people to come in single immersed. We actually had a split. Okay, we now have the Grace Brethren, or they call us Karis now. Changed their name here a while back. But at that day, we called the Grace Brethren Fellowship, and we called ourselves uh, just the Grace Brethren Fellowship. The other group that came off, uh, 
Wingfield, Mike Wingfield. Y'all had him in here to speak in the past? Okay, he's a prophecy teacher and a lot of churches did. Uh, they went with the other group and they called themselves the Conservative Grace Brethren. Okay, and it was all over this issue about do we allow people to come in? Now, where is our church? Here, local. In our Constitution, it says you have to be triune immersed to be a member. Okay, but do I hold people's feet to the fire that you can't come to church? No. Do I say you can't minister? No. What's my standing on this? Allow people to come in and allow me to teach the Word of God. And when they understand that I really should be triune immersed, then we try universe and they have voting rights in the church okay uh, because we stayed at this church did or y'all did before I came as a member of the original uh, Grace Brethren Fellowship okay as we came in now that doesn't mean we can't fellowship together because right now where I am ministering down in Myersdale at the camp that's the Allegheny uh, Grace Brethren Fellowship, uh, that's a district, owned that camp. Well, whenever the split came, they decided we'll work together in the camp. And we have conservative people and we have charist people, we call ourselves now, are all churches or a member of the boards and all that we run the camp by down there. So, but what I'm getting across here is the mindset that comes across. If we are stronger in our faith, then we need to yield to those who are not so strong if it's not contrary to God's will and command. That's the key, okay? If it's something that we can disagree agreeably together, that's what we should do. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach me fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through, listen to this, it was written for our learning, but we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded. See that word there? What does like-minded mean? Of the same mind. We read that back whenever there were being multiplied to the church. They were all in one Honda, remember? That scripture. They were all in one accord. And they were like-minded. And that doesn't just mean up here, but it means up here and down here both. We've got like-minded minds and hearts. One towards another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. It's all about getting along, and that's hard to do. Get an amen on that? Amen. Lord have mercy, I'll go back to it. If everybody just do what I ask them to, you know, if everybody did what I thought was right, we'd be all right, you know, or I would, right? That's the way my dad felt, and I wasn't all right, <laughs> okay? No, what God is teaching and what Paul's teaching here is we need to be able to disagree agreeably, to yield our own character, personality, upbringing, and yield to what other people do, and to be compassionate one towards another. Uh, Yvonne and I had to learn early on too, and you folks probably learned this one already and know it. You, you don't discipline other people's children, right? The best thing to do is talk to mom and dad and go around that way. But that's just one area, okay? We got, try to got to mingle together and be like, that's kind of where I was going here, uh, trying to get a little bit of the uh, contemporary music in, 
tried not to do too much of it, you know, but get a little bit of it in because maybe we could reach others not by taking away from God, but by trying to think a little bit along the ways they think. Now, don't get me wrong here. A lot of churches are looking like the world so they can draw people in, and I never want to be accused of that, you know. But whenever the songs that we enjoy so much came out, you do realize that the older folks thought that they were, <laughs> they were, uh, what would be the word, rebellious, uh, fringe, you know. And that's not the only, that's just one point there, you know. And y'all have been gracious whenever we've been showing, you know, some of those things up here. But all through every aspect of our pulling and unifying together, we need to do as the scriptures sharing with us here, to set ourselves in our own way, sort of on the side, and yield to get along with each other. Okay? Why? Because the whole thing behind the murmuring and the dispute is one entity. What's his name? Satan. Satan wants to kill anything God's doing. And you have heard me say time and time again, if we start seeing uh, ministries work and grow and people doing things in the church, Satan's going to fight us. He's going to do it. And sometimes he does it through us. And when I say us, sometimes he does it through the preacher. You know, he's not above all this. He's a man just like anybody else. The only thing is, is God gave him a, an ability through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And hopefully he yields and becomes as God would have him to be. Okay. Father, we give you praise. We give you honor. Father, uh, you don't scold us. You didn't and whenever Peter was talking and looking for a way to solve the problem of the church. There was no scolding there. But there was uh, an understanding that what's going on right now is not best for the growth of the church, for the glory of God, for the adding to the church. So Lord, help us to learn from these things. Help us to learn from instruction and hold on to it, Father, because I know in my life that, Lord, if I don't keep something before my mind and in front of me, I'll slide back into my old attitudes, my old ways, especially, Lord, the older I get and the tireder I get. Uh, I'll slide back into being a grumpy old man rather than smiling and, and, and looking over things that people say and things that people do that might hurt me. So, Father, I just give you praise and ask you, Lord, to work through us and in us. Most definitely help us to grow that we might glorify you more and more. And, Lord, even lay up treasures that whenever you come and bring your reward with you, we'll receive all that we were uh, up for, expecting. For I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.